uh, let's uh, talk about the Durrells because we have to. Yeah. Because we yeah. have to. So what was the whole process in actually getting the part of Lawrence? Um, yeah, it was like, well, it's a long time ago. Well, not that long ago, but it feels like a long time yeah. ago. Um, and, yeah, I think it was just sort of like, at the, at the time felt like quite traditional. Mm. So you just went in and uh, got sent the script, auditioned. Um, but my memory was there was like a, a good group of uh, friends of mine who would all read it and, um, <laughs> and were obviously the first choices. Because they went <laughs> in and, and, we're, and were kind of saying brilli brilliant things about it. Um, but no, it was. I, I remember reading it and thinking it was incredible. And um, and my agents and and everyone who'd read it were like, "This is something really yeah. cool." Um, but you never know with those things, do you? Really, um, you never know kind of if people are going to take to it. But and they it did. definitely had a good feeling about it. Yeah. yeah. And and what was that like in terms of you know when when a show becomes a smash? And people are talking about it. Yeah, your life kind of changes. Changes. You can't go to the pub and just you know do yeah. whatever you did at the pub before. I'm sure it was all very savoury. Wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was quite. It was. It's kind of felt like a slow burn in that sense because it never felt like I was, you know, one minute just me and then mm. the next minute kind of shot to something else. Um, it. Yeah. It felt like a. I felt so supported. I hadn't. I kind of had a really lucky time with um, people who I've had around me since I left drama school. I kind of straight away signed with an agent um, and a team of agents who were just really supportive. Mm. Never felt like what we were embarking on was this kind of like um, road to Hollywood. Mm. It never felt anything kind of massive like that. It just felt like we were all going job to job and to just genuinely work. interested yeah. in the work. Yeah. So. That's always been the focus, and then, yeah, and then it's and and so I don't know if I, I can still go to the pub. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still do go to the pub, and I feel yeah, I don't feel it, it's even now like I don't, I don't really feel ever, um, you know, if any, if ever anyone does stop and say anything, which isn't that you know all that often, but if they do, <laughs> it's always really nice and approachable and yeah. and kind for now. So, you know. But, uh, I don't know if that'll change. Yeah, maybe, yeah. There's a few things maybe Charles will change that. Exactly, Charles will change that. <laughs> yeah. And are there any anecdotes from the show? Any sort of things that happened on set? That... Yeah, well, we've because the sh because the show is um, obviously the premise of the show is a family who go to Corfu and are surrounded by animals. <laughs> As like, you do. You know, it's like kids and animals. <laughs> um, but we were again. We were so I don't know how we kind of dodged the problems with that because we just sort of. We had Milo Parker, who plays Jerry, mm -hmm. who I guess you could say was the, the kid in that scenario. But he's like sort of more intelligent and smart than any of us and always seemed to be so on his game. So we never felt like he was sort of a kid in that scenario. And then all the animals are so well <laughs> trained. <laughs> trained. <laughs> yeah, better than any of the actors. Telling no, you um, so yeah, so we always felt quite controlled. But there was, there was a... Um, Keely would be livid if I shared this, but I'm going to. Um, which that she was, she had a real problem being upstaged by this pelican <laughs> for the entire <laughs> series. It's like every series she'd be upstaged by this huge pelican. And she's pretty it's difficult. Like, to she's upstage. quite hard to upstage. Yeah, yeah she's that's, pretty good. That's so, um, so that was a bit of, <laughs> that was a bit of a kind of ongoing problem with us. But no, we've had like we've had a really we had a really good time with the animals and that sort of. Um, Never had too many issues with no, them, really. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. I'm going to believe you on that. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> so let's move on to Les Mis. I mean, yeah. wow. That must have been daunting to, to get the part of Marius when, you know, that part is associated with so many greats. Yeah. Yeah, it did feel... Um, Daunting it did feel quite no? daunting. So yeah, no, it definitely so did feel young. daunting. It did feel daunting, but I think there was like, a, again, it was, if, it was a really funny, funny one because when I first left drama school, mm -hmm. I auditioned for Marius in the film. Did and, you really? Yeah, and it was like one of my first ever auditions. Wow. And um, and I I got a piano I got a piano teacher to play the because I had to sing. No, I couldn't play. Yeah, okay. But it was but he was going to play. I found this piano teacher who could play some yeah. lame ears and then yeah. I was practicing my singing and I think halfway through that I thought just you know my first session I yeah. thought maybe 
maybe I can think of a couple of actors, Eddie Redmayne, who might be better at this. <laughs> um, and, and so then, but then, but then weirdly, yeah, I kind of, at the time it felt like a part, I was like, I really want to do that. And then, yeah, I think Andrew Davis, we saw it with War and Peace. I think he does, there's something about his writing that yeah. I think um, he delves deep into these incredible novels yeah. and finds often the heart of the kind of, you know, what we're saying politically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Les Miserables is, um, is a drama that is so relevant to Today, now and what we're kind of experiencing. Wealth inequality. Yeah. Wealth and inequality yeah. and, and also rising an up. act rising up, yeah. and like an act of the people, yeah. um, you know, shouting back at, yeah. at society and, and politics. And what looked like then. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and, right, and, and actually... You know, when we were doing the press for Les Miserables, there'd be that thing of, you know, I'd say a statement like that, and they'd say, well, what, do, you, do you think we're going to take up arms and build barricades on Oxford Street? And obviously, well, obviously not. But, I, but, then, but, then, but then I do think that so there is a similarity yeah, in, yeah. you know, our, our equivalent yes. is Brexit. Yeah, in and many also ways. in a way that it's funny you, you should mention that because the system clearly is broken... Mm. And we are in this strange period of transition. And it's almost as if people who, for, for such a long time, have been ignored yeah. are now speaking up. And that is what really this yeah. is about, isn't it? Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and I think people are finding it hard to know what to speak up about. You know, yeah. there's not an answer. Yep. People aren't offering answers for, the, for, for that. So that's, and that's when you have the power of television. Yeah. That's when, like, you know, Les Miserables can can emote and, yes. and give people the idea of, well, maybe it's not as simple as, you know, for instance, leaving the EU yeah. or, or um, voting for this party yeah. or, you know, maybe it's we need to tackle inequality, you know, inequality yeah. and um, or, you know, growth or yeah. any, anything yeah. we take as red. Yes. Um, maybe we need to challenge that. But and, and um, around yeah. issues around fairness. And around fairness. Yeah. And, yeah, and again, I think um, that was the kind of interesting thing about Les Mis. And Marius is kind of, for me, is at the heart of that because you have this law student who has grown up in uh, a privileged yeah. world yes. um, with this history of his father. And then I think the way he sees, um, what he sees around him in Paris mm -hmm. is... Yeah, it has almost kind of entered his subconscious. It's not, it's not something you notice. Yes. I really like this idea that, yes. and Angie did it, wrote it into the scripts. I really like this idea that you don't, you take these things as red. Mm. You know, it's like we don't, we don't see poverty necessarily yeah. Yeah. in the UK. Yeah. But it's all I, around us. But it's all around us. Yeah. So it's like, well, I Grenfell think this, is an example of that. Grenfell's a great yeah. example. I think I read something the other day that there's like one eighth. Uh, of the population are considered as in work poverty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they're working. Yep. So they've got jobs. So yep. you know employment rates are a boom. Yeah. But um, you know they might be paid. They're paid so little. Yes. Or can only do certain yeah. days of work. Yeah. That they're still classed as poverty. You and know. They're so one step away from homelessness. Yeah. yeah. And so blame is is that. That's it's what that. it's about. So. Well, about I think revenue. it's only right that we take a look. Oh yeah. We have a clip. <laughs> I don't say it's much powerful. in that, do I? <laughs> you don't <laughs> need crying to. Crying away. Yeah. What a powerful scene. And she's amazing. Erin Kellyman's incredible. She And she's someone who's not done... Um, you know, she's so young. Mm. She went and did that, and then she's in Star Wars. And, you know. As you do. Yeah. <laughs> As you sure. do. Sure. <laughs> though, though I must say, you know, if, if you're going to fight for injustice and, you know, speak up for the have-nots in the world... Might as well do it with those sideburns, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Someone said to me, I, I was just telling you before, um, that some, someone said to me recently that I looked like a hobbit in Les Miserables. <laughs> <laughs> not really... I don't know, the, the, <laughs> the same, not quite the same message in Lord of the Rings. But, <laughs> I think that's a compliment. I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> a hobbit with a heart. A hobbit with a heart. Yeah. A hobbit with a heart. Uh, so let's move on to uh, your movie career. Um, and you've done some really fascinating work. I mean, and what's lovely about it is it's so diverse in terms of your character choices. Um, so let's talk about God's Own Country, because that was a film 
that moved a lot of people and also depicted love in a way that we're not used to seeing uh, on screen still, not enough anyway. Yeah. Why was it important for you to choose that role and to show love in all its forms? Um, I think because, um, yeah, I think, I think basically I've, I, I remember reading it and thinking this was um, a, a character who had a fairly, a, a kind of a fairly bleak existence when we meet him. Mm -hmm. um, and he wouldn't comment, Johnny Saxby wouldn't see it as being a bleak existence, he'd just see it as existence. Um, and, and then through that, um, and for obviously Francis Lee's writing has this kind of incredible um, sensory journey to it in mm. itself. But through that is this chink of hope. And I really liked the idea that, <clears throat> um, I, I liked this I, this idea of hope that kind of ran through it, that we that a character that we kind of don't really like, and that was the immediate thing when I read that script is that there was this character that you just felt like shaking him and being and sort of shouting at yeah. him and saying, "Pull yourself together." Yeah, what's um, wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Yeah. And but um, but but that by the end, there's not a full transition. It's not mm. like he's at the end of God's Own Country. Johnny Saxby isn't necessarily. Um, reformed, no. um, but, but you understand him. Yeah, you understand him more, and you can see that there's um, that, that hope has has begun a change or reflection. Mm. You know, even if if it's just reflection for him, and I really liked that. And that's something that, like a, my my real life dad, mm. is big on hope and forgiveness. Mm. And I felt like that was kind of something that's um, been important to me. And um, so that was what that film was really about for me. Yeah. That's what kind of I found interesting. Fantastic. Did you have any trepidation at all to pay, playing a gay character this early on in your career? Um, I honestly don't think Johnny Saxby... Well, first of all, I didn't see him as a gay character. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, I, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's like, I was just kind of thinking about this recently. Mm. It's like Spider-Man, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm with yeah. you here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Spider-Man's chief qualities are that he can move around mm -hmm. using webs. Yeah. Um, and he saves the day, right? But yeah. um, you, I guess you wouldn't say, and it's not, you know, it's not that I can see why people might, but, you know, would you say, I guess, would you say uh, Spider-Man is... Um, uh, did you have any trepidations about playing a scientist character? I would say that's the se secondary to Spider-Man yeah. is that he's a scientist. Yeah, got you. Um, and so in, in many ways, Johnny Saxby, the f his sexuality, the film in many ways isn't, uh, in, in fact, in every way, isn't about his sexuality. It's mm -hmm. about um, his lack of emotional mm. engagement yeah. and the fact that he can't engage emotionally. And his inner he turmoil. He is gay, I yeah. think. But, um, but we don't really comment on it. And so... I just never really saw that as being part of the film okay. in many ways. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. But if that if that ever came along, mm -hmm. um, I would have no trepida uh, trepidations. I would have no um, hesitation. Yeah. And I would love to play uh, as Johnny was. You know. Yeah. And so, in terms of Francis as a director, he has he's really into sort of method acting and really making because he's an actor as well yeah he? yeah he was and yeah. making sure that his cast really <laughs> get so what how did you prepare for the role yeah he uh, well he's just farming in the process <laughs> I did do a bit of farming. <laughs> um he's yeah he's not really like i guess he's just more um he just it's for him it's less me like method acting that can sometimes throw you off course because actually method acting i think has got these connotations of um, staying in character, staying character at all time, times yeah. and um, and often doing some kind of huge physical transformation mm. um, and it wasn't it wasn't really like that mm. it was for us it was about approaching a character and making sure by the time we start you know day one of filming mm. that we'd lived in that character a little bit and we'd explored it to its absolute fullest mm. so for instance we would we had these books that we created um, that would they would be like a sensory Bible. So it would be, um, I mean, the book's probably, 
I know it still exists and it probably smells because it had like <laughs> you know cow dung and yeah. stuff like that in it and um, and then bits of um, hail twine and just kind of like colours and things that we felt were of, represented of, of his, his world yeah. yeah and then I worked on a farm the farm we shot the film on um, again to kind of make stuff second nature so when Johnny Saxby's working delivering sheep or um, inspecting a cow, which he does, um, that it's just like perfunctory. It's not. Mm. It's not a thing. Yeah. You know, and it, and when you work on a farm, it's not a thing. It's what you do. It's you what get you up, do. You yeah. get up at six a.m. and you do your job. So, it was about that, and and you know, Josh, myself going to Yorkshire, mm. I would look around and I'd be like, look at this beautiful landscape and the and the browns and the greens and when the the greens hit the grey of the landscape mm. and isn't that beautiful? And Francis would be like, sort your life out. <laughs> You're Johnny Saxby. Johnny <laughs> this wouldn't is the say work that. He wouldn't look up. And so, yeah, but he's right. And, and so then you'd find yourself um, kind of becoming that, or not becoming the character, but just existing with that mm. character a little bit. Yeah. So it's, um, it was really fun doing that, yeah. Well, congratulations Thank on the you. film. Yeah. It's such an important <laughs> film. Yeah, it really yeah. And let's talk about some of your awards. You've done all right, haven't you, love? Not that going. <laughs> uh, so British Independent Film Awards, you won Best Actor. Yeah. Stockholm Film Awards, uh, Best Actor. Which is a really good award. It's a silver horse. Uh, You've still got it. Where, where have you put the award? It's in, it's in my girlfriend and I's house um, <laughs> yeah. in, in a drawer we call... Un, uh, it's an unidentified drawer, <laughs> which has the kind of weird objects like uh, uh, like an, a, a horse shaped <laughs> horse. award which is a bit weird but um, I'm obviously very proud of it I'm not really? hiding it away um, <laughs> but we just don't know quite where to put it yet it's, um, in the loo yeah. I think oh yeah maybe yeah, yeah, yeah could yeah, be there yeah, yeah. 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 I hear Meryl Streep's got her Oscars in, in the loo all yeah. oh, right good oh, that's enough a good idea. Meryl, good enough for you yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> So oh, now the crown. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Your Royal Highness. <laughs> yeah. It's not yeah. bad, is it? It's quite cool, yeah. 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 Tell me about that. Uh, yeah. Again, we've only just recently finished on the crown. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's been like the coolest. It's been such a nice job and, um, and the coolest experience. We're like, it's, it's kind of bizarre because you'll turn up to turn up to work and you've got all these kind of, you know, your idols or um, uh, Olivia Coleman and, and then Charles love. Dance and, you yes. know, and to, uh, Tobias Menzies and, mm. and all these kind of brilliant staple actors who I sort of grew up with and have idolised. So that's really, that's really exciting. But, but also it's just, yeah, it's like, a, it's like a playground for a young actor. You just get to kind of test out stuff yeah. and feel really safe and not feel like you're it's it's really straight it's that thing where people say so the cr like the crown and it's this big thing and of course it is a big thing mm. but to me it just felt so safe and so like playful yeah. that I never felt under huge pressure, pressure to kind of um, to do anything drastic or and also obviously we see Prince Charles as he is now and you know well, for you, going back in time and seeing the sort of history of his life, yeah. was there a lot of stuff that you didn't know about him that you sort of learned? Yeah. Number one, researching for the part and then obviously playing him. Yeah, there's a lot that I didn't know, um, and uh, which, is, which has been helpful. Are you playing the very friendly years? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. At the moment I am. But um, no, I think he's... But it's, it's actually weird because it's not... I don't think with the crown it's not you it's kind of um you start off by doing some research and the research has been really uh helpful but ultimately with the royal family what we have at our hands everyone has at their hands right you can go onto youtube and find any kind of interview with yeah. Prince Charles yeah. or from that period mm. but what's interesting about the crown and why I think it um it touches audiences is because what Peter Morgan does is he mm doesn't just present us with what we ha what we can see on YouTube. He goes behind the closed doors and the conversations there. And so, um, you know, if you look online, there's a lot of Prince Charles talking about um, the environment, which is brilliant. But I imagine behind closed doors, him and Camilla aren't talking about the environment no. all, the whole time. You know, no. they're 
talking about having cups of tea and other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of stuff. Is it anything uh, you want to share? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, it was about kind of looking beyond, actually looking, taking sort of little things so that people can... Um, register and still identify oh, this is with what they know. Yeah, but then actually going beyond that and trying to f- create a full character mm. that is um, that isn't just yeah. Prince Charles. It's yeah. something else that we, you know, multi layered. Yeah, multi layered. Did you meet him? Have you met him? No, not yet. No. Would that be weird? <laughs> I think no. I don't think it'd be weird. I, yeah. It, again, I feel like it's. Um, I feel like the character now is so distant from him in my mm-hmm. head. Um, that it's like two separate things. And if I met Prince Charles, um, I'm sure it'd be lovely. <laughs> Probably would be a bit weird. In 1972. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How was that? I think the de- I would definitely almost immediately compare ears. And I would want to know. <laughs> like, I'd want to know. Ears are bigger, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think they are definitely bigger. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd want to know how that's been for him. Yeah. How How's it been for you? It's been great. It's been really <laughs> I like you know I, I actually would love to know because um, I think I've I found out the other day that the two features of your face that grow quickest or most in your lifetime are your nose and your ears. Really? Like, I'm yeah, screwed. Yeah, because they keep growing for. <laughs> but you wear them well, sweetie. But they keep yeah. growing forever, don't they? They do. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah. That's what I've heard, Jean. I I'll, I'll be back ten years. <laughs> don't you? Yeah. Uh, so you know I'm going to ask you. Are, are mm. you? Can you do an impression of Prince? Charles? Absolutely not. <laughs> God, no, I got. Please, so it's please, that thing. It's that thing where please, someone did it. Someone. Well, that's better than me. Someone asked me uh, on set. They someone. There was an interview, and they were asked. They kept asking me to do the voice. Yeah. I kept saying, and I was on set, so yeah. this is the best time to catch me trying to do the voice, and. I kept saying, I can't. <laughs> and they said, oh, go on, go on. And they kept pushing me. And I kept saying, I can't. But I was saying, I can't in As Prince Charles. Charles. <laughs> so when they kept saying, oh, go on, I was like, well, if you can't see it now, <laughs> you're never going to be happy. And, uh, and this performance is seriously flawed. Um, so I, Should we try yeah. that out here? Go on, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that was it. That was it. <laughs> Okay, moving swiftly on. Uh, when does the crown start, by the way? Uh, I don't know. I think I it's uh, it's soon. Again, it's, it feels like that thing. Um, sure I'm always the soon. last person to know. Yeah, it's soon. And um, it will be out, and then I'll sort of I'll hear from someone. Yeah. My mum. Well, you'll know this time it's when up. you go to the pub and people start calling you Prince Charles, yeah. as yeah. opposed to Lawrence. Yeah. You know it's out. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay, so let's talk about Only You, which mm. is uh, your new film. Can you tell me what it's about? So Only You is um, a film we made about a year and a half ago, two Mm -hmm. years ago, Um, and it was directed by a director called Harry Woodliffe, um, and it's her first feature film. And it follows a young uh, young couple who meet on New Year's Eve, and, um, and they start off this relationship that develops quite quickly, and she's a little bit older, and so, um, they discuss wanting to have children, mm-hmm. and then they try to conceive and they can't. And then it's about them going through the process of IVF mm. and how that affects a relationship yeah. and um, for, the, for the good and for the bad, and uh, I won't tell you which. A bit of both. Okay. All right, well, let's have um, a look. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, we have a clip. <laughs> well, tell you what, Josh, is if 32's old, I've got no chance. Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's like, and also Lia's like, she looks so young. She looks so young. <laughs> but she's, um, she yeah, she's great. And it's like, and it's a, um, it's kind. Of, I think it's a story that again, it feels like something that we don't it's really so touch modern. on. Yeah, yeah. And, and so modern in terms of you know women having different choices in terms of career, yeah. and therefore the idea of childbirth in in the traditional sense is changing, isn't it? Yeah, well, they're just the pressures on. Um, uh, or the supposed pressures on women to yeah. have children, and but then I think, and also therefore on my character Jake and 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 how he sort of um, Has to how he up. navigates that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Brilliant. Well, we look forward to that. Yeah. We do yeah. indeed. Yeah. Though it looks like those two don't need IVF. They look like there's more. At that than point, though, at that point, it's on. all fine. And then it all. <laughs> and then yeah. it all okay. And you watch the film, and then. 
Yeah, go and watch the film. Go watch the film. <laughs> so, Only You is coming out when? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. I'm looking at John. I, <laughs> um, I think spring. We're in spring. July. July. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, July. Yeah. There you go. July. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> and then you are playing Mr. Elton in Emma. Yeah. Why isn't it? It's it's all right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's quite different to kind of going from a from a king in waiting to a sleazy priest. Yeah. But it, uh, but he's a quite a nice a sleazy priest. All in a day's work. All in a day's work, yeah. Um, yeah, I was filming there today, and uh, it's a really it's a really cool project, and I think um, it feels yeah it feels who like that. It, who else is in it? So it's like all sorts of people. It's all kind of brilliant. Um, Johnny Flynn and Anya Taylor Joy, um, Mia Goth, mm. uh, Bill Nye. Um, it's a really good group of, uh, of people. And and Autumn DeWilde is an American filmmaker, um, photographer, and this is her f- first feature film. Right. But she has a this. Lot of female directors you've worked with. Yeah. Oh, well. God. Yeah. It's cool. I think that yeah. that that's on the rise, um, rightly so. Mm-hmm. Um, Autumn has this amazing, she's, I think she's really exciting. I think she's got this kind of really clear uh, idea of imagery. Yep. So every shot is kind of very clearly set, set up and she knows exactly what she wants, which I think is a kind of such a key role to being a good filmmaker, in Do my you? humble opinion. Yeah. But she, yeah, she definitely has like this really, she's, I think she's going to be, um, it's going to be watch. a really cool film. And, and yeah, for her to be one, one to watch for sure. And you think that, you know, particularly with, much of um, Jane Austen's writing, you know, it, her work touches on many feminist themes that are still relevant today. Do you think having somebody like an Autumn direct this film gives it a different perspective? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> Emma is uh, fascin- like Emma's a fascinating story. Yeah. Jane Austen wrote. Uh, so I, I'd be. I should know the quote, but I don't know the quote. But she said something about Emma, which I really liked, which was um, she wanted to write a character that people would hate, mm. a female character that people wouldn't like, mm. which um, seems crazy, right? That yeah. it's, uh, you know, so many but male often, characters we don't like. We expect um, female characters to be likable. Yeah. It's like they have to be likable. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're often the kind of the light relief yes. or yes. the supporting role. Yeah. Um, Emma is kind of breathtaking, you know, t- film. Yeah, yeah, totally. And um, Emma's kind of breathtaking uh, new vision on uh, female-led projects, I think. Um, and it's cool to go back to the old mm. and bring that into a modern modern day. Um, yeah, so I think that'll be really cool. Is it period pieces? It is period. It's period. And I am, yeah, I'm in breaches, which is... Uh, sideburns again? Uh, no, no sideburns. No sideburns. Yeah, I guess yeah, they saw Les Mis. <laughs> yeah. maybe didn't like it. I don't know. No, no they there. did. Um, but that, I, they were, um, yeah, we, discuss, we did discuss sideburns. You did discuss but, uh, I was on a campaign, uh, an anti-sideburn campaign on this one. Um, <laughs> and won. So yeah, that's great. <laughs> you got your... That's how you know you've arrived. Yeah. You can go on the anti-sideburn, anti-sideburn campaign. And win. And win, I know. And win. So is yeah. there a difference between movies and TV? And which medium do you prefer? Um, there is a difference. But, I mean, the difference is, is uh, only as far as often with television you're making more mm. uh, content. So yeah. it just, it's a longer and shoot. And the character lives with you longer, with the yeah, viewer longer. Yeah, exactly. It? Yeah. But, um, but I think um, with films, I don't know, I, I guess the, the life that a film exists in um, exists for the hour and a half or two hours or whatever it is. Um, and that kind of, m- the process of making a story with an arc like that mm. is, um, is unique. I think then doing it on, for instance, on the Durrells or the Crown and knowing, the Crown particularly is, is particularly interesting because we know, we all know, you know, where we're going and, mm. and various things. Um, and that feels, that feels like a real kind of new mm. challenge to me because you know, to scale that across 20 episodes yep. um, will be, is a challenge and really, but really fun to kind of be able to have some, you know, subtle changes and, and Peter's writing so kind of subtle in and of itself anyway. Um, but they're, they're the main, I guess they're the main differences. But ultimately, it's, it's, it kind of, it's, it all rides on the same thing, which is good characters, good stories, and then group of collectives that are all kind of aiming for the same, same thing, thing yeah. and 
the more I work, the more I realise that at the heart of all of it is just kindness and people being nice to each other. Because it's sort of... Um, it's, it's, it's like it's sort of been lost in, in a lot of industries. But in our industry, maybe yeah. we have lost sight of it a bit. Um, and it now feels like we're, we're grabbing hold of that again. Yeah, and I do think, you know, and we don't need to go too deep into that, but I do think that even when you look at what's happening with the sort of Me Too movement in Hollywood, actually that is a change and a shift where the idea of equality is becoming something that's expected now. So in terms of that idea of treating people fairly and treating people right, it's always like it's going in that way because of that too. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I think the Me Too campaign was obviously <clears throat> um, specifically for, you know... Uh, Everyone. For, yeah, for bad like behaviour, bullying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think beyond that, it's, yeah, it's just... I, I think people hopefully are behaving a bit better. Mm. It just doesn't... It's not... It just... It doesn't make sense. No. It's not practical. No. And actually, the kind of... The film is about efficiency, really. You know, it's, cost, it's such an expensive business. And um, being badly behaved takes more time. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> it takes a lot of energy. So kindness is the way forward. I agree. And on that note, can we give this lovely, talented actor of ours a round of applause? Yeah. And then we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, I think <laughs> she, <laughs> Potion Box. She has this really <laughs> cool Potion Box. Um, I, I don't know if it's called a Potion Box. Okay. I call it that. It just has a water in it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I like the idea it's a Potion Box. I don't know why... As soon as I see Helena Bonham Carter with a box with water in it, I'm like, Being potions. Potion. <laughs> potion. That's because I like Harry Potter, maybe. Um, she's, she's, again, like, going back to the kindness thing, she's mm. one of the warmest people you're likely to meet, and she's, I feel like this real sense of, like, guide from her. She feels really, um, she's obviously incredibly, ta- like, an incredible actress, but, um, yeah, really wise mm. um, was my overriding thing with Helena I wouldn't say again it's like sort of that thing of what's the process and I don't know that I've really nailed what a, what my what my process or what a good process is right. but I think with God's Own Country it's a really weird one where f- kind of bizarrely that accent um, I don't know how but I just I felt I, something about the way my mouth's formed I don't know I was able to speak like that a bit easier um, I find some accents really hard. Mm. Um, I don't know if I'll ever play someone from Newcastle. Um, <laughs> but I'd like the challenge. I think, I think there's like, I think um, basically going from when you start, uh, when you approach any kind of role, um, the voice is a really good way of getting in because there's something about when you create a voice, it does change the, sh- the shape of your face and then suddenly... Um, when you've changed the shape of your face, your, mm. your movement's changing. Yeah. I just like the idea of a kind of trans, a transformation in parts. Yeah. And um, Daniel Day-Lewis always says that when he uh, is coming to a role, uh, he'll like read and read and read and read any books, like obviously books that were related to his character, but he'll read, he'll like consume, drink up books. And gradually, as he's reading in his head, he'll find the voice of the character um, that will kind of speak to him. And mine's not as kind of cool and spiritual as that, but I, I do, I, I see that there's like, there's something about starting with a voice that I think accesses a character better. Mm. And more often, and what's really interesting about that is that I've found that m- more often than not, if, if a director wants something close to my own voice, I actually have to work doubly hard to create a fully interesting character, fully rounded character, because you're almost starting at a disadvantage by not being able to access a different voice. Because it's so much like yourself. Yeah. yeah, and it's like the heart... It's, if, you, if you ever... That thing people say about actors that are like, oh, it's just him. It's like, never knock that. That's like the hardest thing to do. Mm. No one can play Hugh Grant like Hugh Grant can play Hugh Grant. Yeah. Like, it's, the, it's like the best True. thing in the world. Yeah. And if, <laughs> if I could play me on film, then I'd be, the you job's should. a good one. <laughs> but you can't. It's a really hard thing to do. So... Um, Fantastic. Yeah. I think that there's, um, it's a really good question, and I think that there's not a huge difference between both, or I've found so far, it, because you can't, there's no point trying to, it's what, what I was, the point I was trying to make about Charles, there's no point actually mm. trying to recreate Prince Charles, 
Because A, I'll do it wrong, and B, we don't know who he is. So it is still fictitious, um, just as Lawrence Durrell is. I mean, there's not a lot about Lawrence Durrell that we can access, so it's a bit easier in that sense. But there's, I always just think it's, like, it's that thing where there was a great film about Bob Dylan, um, I'm Still Here, I think it's mm, called. Yeah. Or I'm Not There. It's the one black of those. And, white. Um, and there's like, yeah, there's like seven, seven actors, like Kate Blanchett, uh, Ben Whishaw, yeah. all playing, Christian Bale, all playing Bob Dylan. Totem, a lot of them, nothing like Bob. I watched it with my parents, and they were like, doesn't look like Bob Dylan. <laughs> and they were like, well, so no. And I really like that, but I really like the admission that, well, we're not trying to make Bob Dylan. Yeah. We're trying to take the essence, elements yeah. and assen uh, essential kind of qualities of that character. So in answer to your question, I think that there are blurred lines, and I really enjoy messing with those blurred lines. Brilliant. I don't know much about that. I, can't I, I probably can't say very much about The Crown, unfortunately. But um, I would say Did that the intimacy... Did you film any sex scenes in The Crown? <laughs> in my career, I filmed a lot of sex scenes. Um, I won't say about The Crown. OK. Um, I don't think so. OK. Um, but I would say, uh, in fact, I know I didn't. <laughs> um, that would be a bit too much for uh, everyone, I think. Um, uh, no, I think... I think the, as far as intimacy with someone like Prince Charles, again, it goes back to this slight idea of fictitious. You know, there's, there's an element we, like, we, don't, we just don't know. There's yeah. something, it's that thing about the crown, it's like a lot of it, we know the big events. Yep. What Peter's doing, and hopefully what we're doing, is going behind the closed doors before and after those events. Yes. And, and what's, the power of that yeah. is that we can make comments on the political status of the country at that time, or, um, yeah, we can comment on so many things yep. through the royal family. Um, so, yeah, the intimacy is really cool to, to film, basically, but it's not going to get too raunchy. <laughs> um, I'll just, I'm just going to miss them loads. But, but we all hang out anyway. So oh, we all, we, yeah, we all, hang, we all see each other, yeah. With your mates? Yeah. Nice. Um, well, not, you know, as much as we can. Mm -hmm. But they're often, you know, they're all, we all have different lives but the, um i think i just i think i'll miss um the times we've had in corfu have been so much fun and i've had my family out come come and stay with uh, stay with me my girlfriend's been out my best friend's been out um while we've been there and so you know the durrells isn't just it's it's funny because it's it's like it feels and ultimately the heart of it for me and for callum and for daisy and for milo and keely is that group. Mm. But actually, it's so much more than that. And the family extends to, A, an unbelievable crew um, that have been with us all the way through. And, all, and B, just like my family and Daisy's family and Callum's family, who all come and we all just get on. Um, but we, I won't miss it that... I'm going back this summer for a holiday. Uh, so I won't miss Corfu that much because I'll just keep going back. And oh, I'll so try my best. You in your own time, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Nice. I do you like it? Good for you. Uh, it's sunny. It's lovely. You bet you know it very well. Yeah, now. I know it very well. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I'll try and post more pictures of me and Callum. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, a lot of it was on the page. I remember when I first read it, I thought it was it was like Lawrence Sowell was like a, a sort of like with with nail like five, sort of fifty percent with nail in terms of, like, not so psychotic. Um, probably wouldn't rub deep heat on his legs. But, like, he's close. And so, actually, for instance, the dressing gown that is kind of I wear all the way through the series, when I first went for a fitting um, with Charlotte Holdick, who designed all the costumes all the way through, Charlotte had this immediately pulled out this dressing gown, and I was like, this is it, this is perfect. Because my, my image of Lawrence Durrell was mm. this guy, this artist, this writer, mm. sex-obsessed, mm. um, smoking artist, that, um, that he had this kind of ridiculous thing. So, so, um, but the, and also the hand, the hand on the, was I was trying to copy Wacken Phoenix in <laughs> The Master. <laughs> um, I'll definitely come back and do it. Hopefully, yeah, they have me. Um, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not a conscious decision or anything. It's just, it's just it, worked out that way. Yeah, and, it's, and the, the, the truth of the matter is, there's more television and film made, and so, um, you know, I'd love to do some plays. And hopefully, 
at some point I will. But, but yeah, it's just it, there's no like planning. So do you think you would write yourself? Uh, that, that I've fiction? tried. I have tried some. Um, I have tried some um, writing, and I've really enjoyed it. Um, but I'm I'm uh, quite dyslexic, okay. so I find writing a little bit challenging. Mm -hmm. but I think I'm quite interested in exploring different ways of writing, and whether there's a, a way that might be able. I'm, I once, when I first left drama school, I put on a play at the Old Red Lion in Angel, and that was a play that I'd written. And the way I wrote that was that I just spoke it into a dictaphone and then gave it to a mate who typed it in. Okay. So maybe there's something in that, I don't know, but um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, maybe. It's all maybe voice recognition thingies, isn't it? Maybe I know, yeah. Alexa or Siri. Can Alexa can write it for me. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so that's it. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our hour. Oh, Josh, you've been an Thank absolute you. pleasure. Give him another round of applause. Thank you.